you know, we all have a huge number of cells in our body. Nobody has actually counted a human being to know how many cells we have, but estimates range from five to 50 trillion cells in our body. Of course, uh, each cell has the same complement of those three billion little beads of the human genome. Every cell has it, composed of maybe 30,000 genes and other regulatory things that control many things for our well-being. Now, of course, if all cells have all the genes, then how come we have so many different kinds of cells? We have blood cells, we have muscle cells, we have heart cells, we have fat cells, all kinds of cells. They're all different with the same genes. Obviously, the answer is all the genes are not working in every cell. There's a unique set of genes work in each cell type. And that's what determines whether that cell becomes a skin cell or a, a, a brain cell or whatever. And so, but we all started with one cell, right? Long time ago. Yeah. And that one cell divided to two, four, eight, 16, and so on. Those cells had the capability to become any kind of cell. Obviously, that's how we all originated. So there were the master cells. They are omnipotent, so to speak. They can become any kind of cells. So that's the kind of embryo people take cells and multiply to have what is called embryonic stem cells. But then going down the differentiation route, they lose the ability to become any kind of cells, but they retain the ability to become some kinds of cells, some different kinds of cells. So they go from omnipotent, so to speak, to pluripotent. They can become many different types of cells. In every organ we have, we have regenerative capacity by having some stem cells that retain the ability to differentiate into the cells of that organ. But of course, as we get older, the number of cells that have that capability, the stem cells in each organ, decreases. Now, in the scalp, for example, the cells that make the pigment, when we age, we lose them, and the stem cells that can become pigment-making cells also decrease. So we have gray hair because you can't make the pigment. That is true on every organ that we have. The regenerating capacity decreases as we age. So when an organ is damaged, like heart, the regenerating capacity is limited. And of course, this is where we have a heart attack, for example. It would be nice to provide added capability. Of course, it would be nice to have real omnipotent cells like the human stem cells, embryonic stem cells, but it has also ethical problems I don't want to go into, of course. You hear people, some politicians say that the adult stem cells are far superior. Carl Rowe, for example, made the statement they are far superior to the embryonic stem cell. Of course, that is factually not true, of course. Last week, Zahern is the NIH director, made a plea to the Congress asking for funding for increased research in stem cells, including embryonic stem cells, and he made it very clear <coughs> embryonic stem cells are far superior. And you're going to hear a lot about the ethical issues and all the rest of those things. But it is really remarkable that in recent times, people have dis are discovering ways to take stem cells to, regenerate, to help the regeneration process. I was just talking to somebody. There is a study, there is a 50-some patient limited study for taking stem cells derived from bone marrow called mesenchymal cells. One donor can give you enough cells that you can multiply to billions of cells. A biotech company has done that, serious, and that's the name of the company, and they're distributing to various centers, multi-center study, but only 50-some patients. And last week, they announced significant improvement. That is, if you inject into the bloodstream, the heart function, if you do it 
soon after a heart attack, one to 10 days or thereabouts, there is a regenerative capacity because those stem cells injected there have two advantages. One, they don't elicit immune response. That's the nature of those cells. The other advantage is they know how to get to where the damage is. So you can just put in the bloodstream, they will go to the damaged heart. There are many other studies going on where they directly inject into the damaged part and so on. So there are a lot of examples of at least limited success beginning to appear in the use of these stem cells. And so it is a very timely subject and controversial and you have experts to hear from and so I won't really take too much more of their time. I'll just introduce the moderator. We are fortunate to have Dr. Todd Husty as the moderator today. Dr. Husty received his doctorate in osteopathic medicine from Kansas City College of Osteopathic Medicine and is a board certified emergency room physician and a former editor of the Florida College of Emergency Physicians. He has been the medical director of several emergency rooms in the area and is currently the the, on the staff of the Winter Park Hospital. He also serves as a medical director of emergency services for Seminole County. He also owns his own company, Medical Audit Resource Services Incorporated, that serves the local uh, hospitals and the like. He's a highly sought after speaker he has been the medical reporter of WESH News Channel 2 since 1995, so obviously he is very knowledgeable in the business. And I think the discussion of stem cells is actually a discussion of what do you do with our genes? How do they get expressed? What turns them on? What turns them off? Just knowing the genes can help us identify disease and may be able to help us treat disease, but there's so much to know that we're trying to take a shortcut. That's basically what stem cells are, is to take a shortcut because you don't have to manipulate each individual gene. You're now manipulating cells that are already set up to express genes. So with 30,000 genes and many interactions between them, this is, a, this is an easier way. Obviously, there's nothing easy about it. I just want to make it clear. There are many sources of stem cells. There are embryonic stem cells. They are the least differentiated stem, stem cells out there. They have not had any genes turned off yet. So they basically have the potential to turn on in any direction. Then you have fetal stem cells, and I'm making this simple for me. It's more complicated than this, so those of you, I, I have to keep it simple. What's the end of that? Anyway, but um, <laughs> uh, then there are fetal stem cells, which have differentiated to some extent and are still found in the amniotic fluid and sometimes in cord blood. Then there are adult stem cells, which, I mean, I actually learned about adult stem cells when I was in medical school before most of you were born. And um, we learned about, about uh, stem cells found in bone marrow. And bone marrow is really the classic case of, boy, there are these cells that can become any blood cell in the human body. They can't go backwards, or at least, excuse me, we're not sure they could go backwards and become a heart cell or a muscle cell or in anything else, but they be can become any blood cell. So they're, they're not differentiated all the way to red blood cell or white blood cell or platelet. So we still have persistent adult stem cells, and as uh, Dr. PK said, is, is that indeed every single type of, of organ in our body has has adult stem cells, but as you move from embryonic stem cell to fetal stem cell to adult stem cell, they, they're more differentiated, which means more of those genes have been turned off, and it makes it harder to get them to go in the direction you want. So um, what I'd like to discuss now is so that actually brings up a little issue. The issue is, is, is it right or wrong to harvest embryonic stem cells? We are going to get in that today. Panelists, are you prepared? <laughs> we are going to discuss that. Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting is the ethics in medicine are the end of life ethics. When does life end? You know, what do you do to pro prolong life? I mean, there are some, that, that was going around when I was in school, how long can we prolong life? The beginning of life issues. When does life begin? What do we do to try to preserve that life? How far do we go? I mean, do you take care of 18-week gestation babies that you might have to put in a test tube to keep them alive? Is that right or is that wrong? We're getting there. 
you know, it used to be 30 weeks was sort of the magic. Now that then it was 26, then it's 24. Now I've seen 22s that have survived. At what point do you not do that anymore? Or I guess that actually begs another set of questions. Because we can, should we? Oh, what's the flip side of that? Because we can, shouldn't we? So that's the, the, the issues of embryonic stem cell are huge. They come down to some things that are basically, they be, that are very, very near and dear to each person in this room. If you've ever thought about it, they're very personal decisions. I was talking with another emergency physician who kind of quickly let out that he's really against embryonic stem cell. And I kind of, I, I have to totally respect that. And I promise you, you won't know my feeling on this by the end of this because I'm trying to be a good moderator. But yet I know I could tell from this gentleman who I just met that he has strong feelings. You all might also. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't open our minds and at least discuss both sides of the issue. So there's another ethical issue which we might get into, genetic manipulation for choice or for healing. Well, there's a country over in Europe that did it for choice. Oh yeah, that was ugly. So, and actually the AMA has taken a stance is that if it's for healing and for curing, it's okay. If it's just for choice, it's not. But, you know, if you only have one shot at having a child, should you not have a choice at what that child is like? Wow, that's provocative. Anyway, so then there's the politics. We're going to get into the discussion of politics. We have a, a political science person in the room who is, and really a lot of that does stem from, stem from our ethics and belief and the beliefs of the constituents, the, the, the mood of the country, and whether you're a Republican or Democrat, although some, this, this issue crosses borders. Yeah, uh, all stem, uh, stem cell things already uh, everybody talked about, so I don't have to talk about the stem cells. So my question is, what makes human to be human? How can they behave like a human? So the brain. You know, the tissue transplantation, we can do, right? If you uh, have a kidney failure, you, we can transplant the kidney. So why don't we just uh, transplant the brain? We have a brain bank somewhere, right? But I don't think so. If you transplant the brain, if you have somebody else's brain, that's not you anymore. So I would say, Brain, the final frontier. We need a brain. <laughs> but also, stem cells, right? I have to talk about the stem cell a little bit. Uh, in Florida, uh, okay, so the Alzheimer disease, that's a tragic disease. Alzheimer found this one like 100 years ago, and the brain shrank in the patient brain, okay? And then uh, that makes like this happy couple to become like this. So he tried to reach out to her, but he, she cannot respond it. And then uh, you might remember, of course, this gentleman. Uh, he survived assassination, but he couldn't survive the Alzheimer's disease. And uh, this is the last moment saying goodbye to everybody. I mean, he said uh, this cross, he had the Alzheimer's disease. How, how do you feel? So we have to do something. So the, fortunately, Florida has a fountain of youth in the center of, uh, you know. And that's where the, this uh, Ponce de Leon tried to find those in Florida, uh, across the ocean, but, uh, in St. Augustine. I went there, but that's not so great, you know, salty taste water. <laughs> okay, so this is the picture I found on the internet calling fountain of use. Right in the middle, you can see the, uh, like a sphere floating. That reminds me stem cells. So this is a stem cell I isolated from the uh, nine weeks old human fetus brain. Okay. So we can isolate the stem cell from the human fetus and then create the uh, variety of the brain cells, including the neuron and glia. Here's the uh, neurons human neurons in the vitro, human astrocyte, glia in vitro, okay? And uh, this is the uh, movie, I, actually the, uh, after those cells differentiated under the microscope. You can see the large cells, that's astrocyte, and small cells moving along the edge of the astrocyte. 
That's the neurons. That's what the cells we want to have in our brain. So although this is in vitro, okay, but uh, this may happen in our brain in vivo. So we try to do that. We transplant the cells uh, into the uh, rat brain, not the human brain yet. Before that, we did the water maze. This is the water maze. Here you can see the gore, that's a platform, a little bit beneath of the water. So the animal cannot see it. But the animal doesn't want to swim forever. So the, it's going to memorize and reach there. That's what we call spatial memory. This memory particularly lost in Alzheimer's disease. So we use this one as Alzheimer model. OK, so this is the results the before transplantation. Young animal, of course, they can reach to the goal pretty good. And, but some of the young animal, they are OK. They are not so great, uh, kind of stupid, kind of silly, or whatever. <laughs> But uh, those changes in increase by the age, at the 24 months old, that's the lifespan of this animal. Then you can start to see this group of animal never reach to the goal. Even if we put the animal onto the goal, they kick out from the goal. They don't care, like Alzheimer. Okay. But uh, some of the animals still okay. They behave like a young animal. Okay. So we mark the cells in vitro and transplant using the stereotaxic and into the brain, right there. And I let it go for weeks, and we did automate again. So this is before and after. Like this animal, tremendous improvement in cognition. So they can reach the goal very quick, even better than the sum of the young animal. Surprise. And another interesting thing is all, all such a stupid young become smart. Some people told me, oh, of course, because we put the human cells into the rat. <laughs> yeah, of course. And uh, yeah, uh, matter of fact, those animals start to speak Japanese. <laughs> so this is the statistics, OK? Before transplantation, after transplantation, we saw the significant improvement in cognition. So it works, right? But the control doesn't do anything good. So when we look at the brain of those animals, this green is a neuronal marker, neurons. And this red is the marker for the transplanted cells. So the transplanted cells became beautiful neuron in the cortex. And the hippocampus, those areas where we needed such a new cells to make a good memory. And uh, yeah, another thing you might notice is the human cells much bigger than the rat cells. This blue are the rat cells, and this green the human cells. But still, the beautiful neurons we can make. So maybe the, uh, those fetal stem cells is the answer to treat Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so forth. And all the media, you know, they liked it. But, always bad. The question would be immune response. So if the cells get the immune response, they chewed up by the immune cells. Another question, anybody wants to have somebody else's brain? I wouldn't. Uh, you know, uh, somebody says, the Einstein, if I can get Einstein's brain, that's OK. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, like a, a thrill seekers, gambler, or skydiver, they have a little bit different gene. Uh, we call it the D2A1 uh, ally, such a little bit changes. But if you get those cells in your brain, you might just start to jump from the airplane. <laughs> you never know. Another thing is, the, uh, do you want to see this happen? You can see in a minute, uh, making a fetus from the egg, right, embryo. And this is a fetus. Because a fetal stem cell is much better than the embryonic stem cell, because they know what to become. If we isolate the, uh, from the brain, they can become brain cells. If we isolate from liver, they can become liver, whatever. So that's another thing, ethical probe. So what we are proposing here is that this is the embryonic stem cell. They can differentiate into the certain type of the stem cells by the embryonic cue. Now, for example, I'm taking a neural stem cell and a mesenchymal stem cell from the bone marrow here. And neural stem cell only become brain 
but then kind of stem cell only become bone, muscle, cartilage, those connecting tissue. So if I put this uh, mesenchymal uh, stem cell in a brain, we're going to have a bone in your brain. All right, that's not good. So the, my proposal is we just bring them back, de-differentiate, uh, back to the stage, and then bring them to the uh, neural stem cell and make a brain cells. That's one. Another proposal is to just increase the neural stem cell in your brain. You have stem cell in your brain still. Adult, everybody. I hope still I have some left over. Okay. Why don't we just increase those? Those two approaches. One is that this is a bone marrow stem cell. We introduce the uh, gene from the uh, embryonic stem cell. Then we start to see the embryonic stem cell formation here. They can grow a lot. And then we can do the uh, another gene check. Oh, all the embryonic stem cell genes start to express. So they look like embryonic stem cell. How about uh, if they behave like embryonic stem cell? So this is the cells. We put the, such a gene. We put it in a basket, which has a membrane in the bottom. And then uh, we create a human brain tissue, actually the uh, uh, fetal uh, neural stem cell in a culture. And then we put those baskets on the top. That way, those cells almost like being in a human brain condition. So after that, we start to see the cells differentiate into the neurons. This green are the neurons. And the morphology-wise, they looks like a neuron from the embryonic stem cells. This is another picture. And not only that, uh, this one is a little bit different cells, but uh, uh, we treat the cells in a way to de-differentiate and put it into the brain. We can see the neurons in the brain, hippocampus. We can see the neurons, beautiful neurons. So it means they also behave like a, a, a neural stem cell. And not only that, uh, by introducing the certain gene, we can make a dopaminergic neuron. We can make a cholinergic neuron, which can be used for the Parkinson and Alzheimer's disease, and also in the hair cells. If you go to the rock concert, uh, bam, 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 the big noise. The, see, you, you're going to damage your uh, inner hair cells. You need this. So that's the thing. Another thing is the uh, uh, stem cell population in the brain. We checked memory impaired animal. I told you the animal almost like Alzheimer. They don't have any stem cell anymore. This is in the cortex. This is the aged memory impaired animal. Still memory OK one. They still have a two dots, two dots, right? You can see that? That's a stem cell there. So the, maybe the stem cell population in the brain is quite important to maintain a day-to-day uh, -day normal you know, brain function. But we have a compound which increases the stem cells a lot. Tremendous increase. You can see lots of dots after this treatment. We just inject this compound peripherally, I mean, you know, not in the brain. Then we can see the such increase. When we count the number of the cells, tremendous increase, sevenfold increase. So maybe this is good. And when we check the uh, home of the stem cell, that called uh, subventricular zone, right in the middle of the brain. Okay. And again, aged memory impaired animal, they have much less stem cell compared to the normal impaired animal. But after drug treatment, such a compound. Tremendous increase, tremendous increase. Not only the just increase, but also they start to migrate out and become neurons. That's good. So I think that's a story. This is my lab, OK? Yeah. Maybe I can stop right here. You may or may not be aware of this, but there are currently clinical trials going on where they are actually putting stem cells into people for myocardial disease. I mean, some of it was uh, mentioned earlier. Um, some of these trials have already been com completed. Uh, they're going on not only in this country, but in several countries around the world, Germany, Japan, other countries in, in Europe, Asia, um, actually much more so there than they are here. Uh, but there are some going on here as well. Um, most of these. Uh, studies are dealing with bone marrow, that is adult stem cells. 
Um, there are some that are dealing with uh, skeletal muscle myoblast stem cells where you can take muscle from that would normally become skeletal muscle. It still can contract and act like a muscle and put that into, into hearts. Um, so far, the studies that have been conducted have been shown to be relatively safe and sometimes effective. That is, there's an improvement in outcome, cardiac performance, quality of life. They, ha they haven't been staggering improvements. I'm not going to go through the details of these. You may hear some of that from um, some of the other speakers later. Uh, but just to say that these trials are going on, that so far there hasn't been any serious adverse effects associated with transplanting stem cells into people. And in fact, the outcomes for some of these studies have been shown to be quite positive. So um, what are stem cells? Just to give a very brief background. We've heard some about this already. Um, there are, we can generally categorize them into two major classes. One, adult stem cells uh, shown schematically here. The other, embryonic stem cells, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, adult stem cells can come from bone marrow. They can come from uh, actually almost every organ in the body. Uh, as Dr. Sagai mentioned, in the, in the brain has its own reservoir of stem cells. The heart also has its own reservoir of stem cells, as does every organ, probably every organ. Not all of them have been studied, but of the ones that have been studied, they find a small amount. And of course, these, as has been indicated already, age with the normal aging time and become more and more limited in their potential. So the limitation, really, of adult stem cells is just that, that they, you know, if you're an older adult and you're trying to harvest your stem cells for some therapeutic application, they may have very limited potential, may have no stem cells or very limited stem cells that can actually be used for such purposes. Um, on the other hand, embryonic stem cells show the promise of having, you know, much greater capacity, right? There, it's, it's sort of invigoration of youth, if, if you will. Um, these embryonic stem cells can be isolated uh, from a number of ways and a number of different sources. The classical, say, original way to identify them and isolate them was from a blastocyst, it's from an embryo. Uh, this is the inner cell mass when this uh, embryo is just a ball of cells and they form a slight inner cell mass. Uh, here, they, th those cells can be collected um, and cultured and through various treatments and culture can be coaxed to differentiate into virtually any type of cell that you so desire that can be expanded and cultured. Um, so that's what stem cells are essentially and um, now how can we use them? So I'm going to switch. So I'm going to switch programs here just briefly and talk a little bit about some of the research applications that we're doing that um, involve stem cells. I got in involved with this particular problem or this issue by um, really by accident. I wasn't studying stem cells at all. I was studying cardiac development. Specifically, I was studying how cells in the developing heart produce and regulate production of, of adrenaline, the hormone, the stress hormone. You know, we, we all feel if we get stressed out, you have a surge of adrenaline, your heart starts beating faster, it starts beating more vigorously, you become, you know, it's the fight or flight response kind of thing. Uh, through some studies it was doing um, actually at Stanford at the time, uh, we found that the heart itself is producing these hormones very early in development, right when the heart was first starting to beat. In humans, that would be about three weeks after fertilization, before most women even know that they're pregnant. The heart, embryonic heart's already starting to beat. In rats and mice, it's about nine or ten days after fertilization. This is actually a picture of a rat heart, a section of, of a rat heart, um, and 
at embryonic development day, uh, about 11 and a half, um, you're looking at here the atrial chamber, that's the filling chamber. This is the ventricular chamber where the blood would come in, uh, into the ventricle and then get pumped out. If you can imagine this in three dimensions through the outflow track up here. What we identified through um, an adrenergic cell marker was, were these adrenaline producing cells in these early stage hearts, in these early stage hearts. And um, they tended to be clustered right in the um, SA node area. This is the pacemaking area of the heart, what drives the electrical impulse. They're specialized muscle cells. We also saw some scattered throughout the muscle layer. And through a series of, of additional experiments where we can map the fate of these cells, where did they go, where did they become, we found that actually large numbers of them um, appeared in the heart. This is a mouse heart. This is a transgenic mouse heart experiment where we um, were able to track these cells. I'm not going to go through all the details of the experiment, um, but you can see the darkness, it's actually a blue stain, um, shows where these cells are located in the developing embryo. If you look at a control embryo, you don't see any of them because they're not stained, but here you can see the heart. You can also see some in the neural crest and, and other areas. Um, through a series of other experiments related to this, we were able to follow the fate of these cells. They only transiently produce adrenaline. I'm giving you the punchlines here uh, during development, probably to stimulate local production of the heart, um, heartbeat before the nerves come in, before the adrenal gland is even produced, um, and that's very important. But then they don't really go away. They stay around, but they don't produce adrenaline anymore. They differentiate and they differentiate into what? They differentiate into beating cardiomyocytes. Not only the working cardiomyocytes in the muscle, but the specialized cardiomyocytes that drive the electrical impulse of the heart. Um, and this is just a schematic kind of to show that. You have start with, let's say, an embryonic stem cell. If you can imagine this developmental process, it goes through some series of steps, which we really don't know that much about, becomes a cardiac stem cell. The heart is composed of not just muscle, but muscle and other types of tissues. Um, but so through some of these, they go through these we'll call cardiomyocyte stem cell. These are stem cells that will become the various forms of cardiomyocytes within the heart. And the, it, when they're at this stage, they're actually producing adrenaline hormones. And we can identify them based on their ability to produce adrenaline because they're producing a specific set of enzymes. And we can target them and we can find them at that stage. So we have developed a research strategy. I'm not going to go through all the details of this, but just a very broad overview of what we're trying to do is isolate these specific stem cells. Now with mice, embryonic stem cells have been around and been used in the laboratory for many, many years now. In fact, mice are a beautiful genetic organism because we can grow these embryonic stem cells in culture. We can alter the genes in culture. We can make transgenic mice. I showed you one version of that. We can delete genes. We can add genes in. We can do fairly extensive genetic manipulation in the mouse model. We can take these cells, isolate, in, and actually in vitro, differentiate them into beating cardiomyocytes. So you take the cells, you put them in these uh, you, in culture. Um, very briefly, you make these hanging drops with these balls of cells. You go through a series of, of culture techniques, and you plate them on a, onto culture dishes. And it takes about a week. But you go from these pluripotent cells that can become almost anything in the body to cells that are actually beating spontaneously in culture. Right? So we're doing that routinely. We can then, from this population, based on the expression of these adrenergic or adrenaline-producing enzymes, isolate the specific population that is destined to become this or that type of cardiomyocyte. Um, and then we're trying to track them in vivo after we transplant them into a mouse using various imaging techniques, such as magnetic resonance imaging and, um, more recently, bioluminescence imaging. Uh, the way we do that is to load these cells with magnetic or uh, super paramagnetic microsphere particles. Um, these particles are relatively inert in terms of uh, how the cell functions. We should put them into the cells. We can show that they're still beating. They seem to be functioning fine. And we can um, then transplant them into the heart. 
and follow them in vivo. So this is our model. It's a mouse model of myocardial infarction. We actually do the surgery, ligate the coronary artery, create an infarct, inject the cells on either side. We can follow it using um, magnetic resonance imaging. This part of the work was actually done at the University of Virginia in collaboration with one of our um, collaborators, Dr. Brent French. And this just shows you an example of a mouse heart here, pre-ligated. And this is the myocardial infarction model. And this is one that had been ligated. This is 28 days post-infarct. You can see how much larger the left ventricular chamber is here compared to the normal control, um, how thin the wall is. And um, what we're doing now is we're trying to transplant in stem cells to repair that. This is um, just an example showing you where we can track these cells in vivo after we transplant them in. And you can see these dark regions here show that. This is intact animal in vivo over time. So um, that's sort of where the work is now. I don't have time to go into much more details about it. I'd just like to acknowledge some of the people that um, have done that. In my lab, uh, these folks, and in Dr. French's lab, these folks at the University of Virginia that helped out with the magnetic resonance imaging part of it. Thank you very much. In August of 2006, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life released its latest poll data regarding the attitudes of Americans regarding stem cells and their research. The poll indicated that a clear majority, 56% 50 of Americans, believed that it was more important to conduct stem cell research in hopes of curing disease and medical conditions than to avoid destroying the human embryos in that research, a position held by only 32% of those polled. Moreover, since the Pew Forum began gathering poll data in 2002, the changes in those numbers suggest a growing acceptance of stem cell research among Americans. In 2002, only 43% believed conducting research was more important, a mere five percentage points greater than those favoring the protection of potential life in human embryos, held by 38%. Clearly, support for stem cell research is on the rise in American public opinion, but analysis of the factors influencing the position any given American takes on these issues is very revealing. In the 2005 study of those who favored stem cell research, 31% report what they have observed in the media has influenced their decision, with an additional 28% citing their educational background as the source for their position. But of those who oppose stem cell research, 52% say they do so based upon their religious considerations. Breaking this down even further, stem cell research support is weakest among evangelical Protestants, with only 44% support in the 2006 survey, and strongest among mainline Protestants, with 73%, and those reporting no religious affiliations at 72%. Despite the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops' statement that destruction of embryos for stem cell research was immoral and illegal, a majority of American Catholics have favored stem cell research since 2004, with 58% preferring research to protection of human embryos in the 2006 survey. With a steady majority of Americans favoring such research and opposition hovering about one-third of the population, the question would seem to be settled. But I would like to suggest that there are two good reasons why this is not a defensible position. First, to reduce complex questions of bioethics to simply matters of popular sentiment is to engage in the crudest of majoritarianism, the tendency in American culture that Alexis de Tocqueville noted two centuries ago in which majorities tyrannize minorities subject to their decision making in the democratic process. One of the questions that must be answered by those who would utilize such an approach is whose voices are counted in such decision making. Can those whose fate rests upon that process, human embryos, be denied a voice and still have such a decision making process be seen as democratic, much less ethical? A second reason that religious voices should be considered in these deliberations is because they bring to the table a different set of considerations than that of science or politics. 
Scientist Richard Dawkins distinguishes the differing roles of science, which offers the how, and religion, which offers the why, of any understanding of our existence. While religion is hardly the only discipline raising questions of meaning, philosophy being its secular companion in that quest, in a culture where religion is such a vital aspect of self-understanding as in America, to ignore the questions religions raise would be tantamount to intellectual dishonesty in any endeavor to fully discuss stem cell research. Not surprisingly, many religious groups in America have formulated statements regarding stem cell research. Evangelical Protestant group Focus on the Family decries the killing of human embryos, which it calls the tiniest of human beings, and suggested that such violated the medical ethic of do no harm. The Southern Baptist Convention is on record as opposing elective abortion, the use of fetal tissues from elective abortions, and any experimentation using embryonic stem cells. Along with the Catholic bishops, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America opposes in vitro fertilization because of the potential for the eventual destruction of unused human embryos. But not all religious bodies oppose stem cell research. The Union of American Hebrew Congregations of the Reformed Tradition in Judaism have issued a statement citing the requirements to use God-given knowledge to heal people and to save lives where possible as justifying the use of fetal tissue transplants. The Episcopal Church, of which I am a priest, issued a statement from its 2003 General Convention supporting the choice of those who wish to donate embryos to research and supporting federal funding for embryonic stem cell research, so long as the embryos are not needed for procreation, were not deliberately created for research purposes, or obtained by sale. And Buddhist scientist Young Moon from Korea's Seoul National University sees cloning one of the possibilities of stem cell research as a different way of thinking about the recycling of lives, a very Buddhist way of thinking, he says. Part of the difficulty in discussing religious aspects of stem cell research is the obfuscation of these issues in highly volatile, loaded descriptions by opponents of the research which often purport to speak, without warrant, for all people of faith. Former Orlando Sentinel columnist Charlie Reese recently said in a column, it is ridiculous for people who have already decided that it is moral to kill babies in the womb to show some squeamishness about destroying human embryos in a Petri dish. Hell, man, once you decide to become a child killer, their ages no longer matter. Or the numbers. Damnation of your soul is completed with the first one. Charlie's always been known for his ability to uh, spice things up. Similarly, to Coa Georgia-based evangelical Protestant website covenantnews.com lists articles about stem cell research under headings such as murder by abortion and get your human sacrifice here. The link to those stories was labeled murder.htm. At the crux of religious concerns about stem cell research is the process by which stem cells are created. While adult stem cells can be created from adult human bone marrow, blood, body fat, and some organs, the resulting multipotent cells are limited in their abilities to differentiate into all kinds of different cells in our bodies and could potentially create risks such as the development of cancer in the recipients. Pluripotent cells, those capable of becoming any kind of cell in the human body, are mainly available from miscarried fetuses, a limited uh, source, or those human embryos resulting from in vitro fertilization deemed surplus when sperm and egg donors no longer want or need them for impl implantation. Now, some estimates of human embryos currently on cold storage in the United States soar as high as 400,000. While miscarried fetuses are already dead, the process of creating stem cells from frozen human embryos capable of implantation and possible successful pregnancy results in the destruction of the human embryo with its potential for life. For Duquesne University ethicist David Kelly, the creation of stem cell lines through the destruction of human embryos draws into focus two ethical issues. The question of consent and the question as to when human personhood begins. K. 
Kelly notes that while the focus in American bioethics has been primarily on individual freedom, autonomy, and choice, Catholic ethics are strongly informed by a virtue ethics approach, which puts far more emphasis on the rightness and wrongness of what is done. Now clearly the American bioethical approach has problems in the context of stem cell research. If the focus is on individual consent, how can an embryo give informed consent? In a society where children are presumed to be unable to give consent, how much less capable would a fetus be seen in doing the same? Historically, in Western culture, parents have been seen as being the legal owners of their children, capable of giving consent on their behalf if not disposing of their offspring slash property at their own discretion. By extension, that same principle could apply to their in vitro conceived human embryos. But do societal laws today not exist to protect children from precisely the kinds of harmful effects that the destruction of human embryos entails? Are children not seen as more than the property of a parent? How might not yet implanted embryos be considered in light of such protections? Kelly notes some ethicists would argue that consent could be presumed from mere membership in a common humanity to whom duties to heal chronic human illnesses and debilitating medical conditions supersede interests in ongoing existence of human embryos in cold storage. But do human beings have an obligation to consent to medical procedures, which though they might benefit others, require one's own death in the process? The second issue Kelly raises is even more difficult. What constitutes human personhood, which Kelly defines as human life with full basic rights? And it is here that it is important to consider his, the history of this question. Prior to the 19th century, Christianity, like its sister religions, Judaism and Islam, saw pregnancy as beginning when it was tangible, visible to the world, usually around 40 days a point called the quickening. In the Middle Ages, philosopher and Dominican theologian Thomas Aquinas would develop that understanding further with the newly discovered teachings of Aristotle that without a brain, a fetus was incapable of housing a soul. Aquinas spoke of a progressive development of the, fe of the fetus through stages, a vegetative soul, an animal soul, and ultimately a human soul. Now, Thomas argued that boys got their souls at the 40 days quickening point, while girls had to wait the full term of their pregnancy, 90 days, before their souls only then begrudgingly inhabited their bodies. <laughs> this was the teaching of the Christian tradition until the time of the Reformation and thereafter within Roman Catholicism until the 19th century. Now, ironically, the changes in church teaching would have more to do with revelations from the budding discipline of genetics than anything particularly divine. With the publications of the findings of monastic Gregor Mendel in 1866 and the building of microscopes strong enough to actually observe the human ova, previous notions of the sperm being the carrier of the homunculus the tiny, intact human being simply in need of development within a female uterus which merely housed it until birth but contributed no genetic material were no longer available, or no longer viable. The fallout from Mendel's discovery prompted a new teaching from the Roman magisterium. A pronouncement by Pope Pius IX in 1869 that abortion was a sin carrying the penalty of excommunication the implication then being that ending a life now seen as, the, as beginning at conception is a mortal sin. For Christian ethics, the status of the embryo is a crucial concern implicit in which is the question of precisely where human personhood arises. Personhood, Kelly says, is an attribute of human beings and not at least most claim that it is not, an attribute of other animals, even somewhat smart ones like dolphins and apes, though it may be said to characterize intelligent extraterrestrials if such are found to exist. Christian ethicists have focused on three primary approaches to answering the question of whether an entity is a human being, a human person. The first approach utilizes the ability to use reason as its primary consideration. 
Now, of course, such an approach by definition excludes infants and severely mentally disabled persons from its scope. Is such an approach truly useful? A second approach is to look at potentiality to become a free, rational, autonomous, and theologians would add spiritual or self-transcendent being. Such could easily include fetuses and embryos. But what kind of potential? And exactly how much would be necessary to cross the threshold into human person status? Those all remain questions. The third approach would simply claim that membership in the human species is enough to be a human person. But such a, an approach avoids the primary question. When is it we can ac accurately say that a new member of the human species comes to be? Moreover, how is the concept of human species understood? Have there not been times in human history when groups of people such as American Indians and African slaves were seen as less than human? So when does human personhood begin? Three schools of thought exist on this as well. The social consequences school would deny any possibility of attaining objective evidence and simply claim that human personhood begins when adult humans say it does. Not surprisingly, most religious ethicists find a definition lacking any criteria troubling. Even so, Roman Catholic teachings have explicitly refused to resolve this issue. In the 1974 Declaration on Procured Abortions, the Congregation for the Doctrine, uh, Doctrine of the Faith said, this declaration expressly leaves aside the question of the moment when the spiritual soul is infused. There is not a unanimous tradition on this point, and authors are in disagreement. Yet the statement goes on to draw a moral conclusion. The potentiality present from the moment of conception means that the human embryo must be treated as if it were a human person because it is human life preparing for and calling for a soul. This, however, raises yet another question. At what point in, concep in the conception process is such potentiality realized? The geneti geneticist school, the second of the three schools on personhood, argues that because everything is present for human potentiality and thus for the implement implantation of a human soul, within the one-celled zygote formed from sperm and egg, human personhood begins at conception. This is probably the dominant tradition right now within the current Vatican. Yet a third school's explanation continues to be heard among Christian ethicists. The developmentalist school argues that because the potential for division of a single zygote into twins does not pass for two to three weeks from conception, the zygote cannot be seen as a human person with the potential for an individual soul until then. Developmentalists also argue that human personhood is not possible for human embryos until the neural system is sufficient for even nominal neurological and thus rational activity, an argument which would stretch the window out to about 20 weeks. Such an understanding could easily accommodate practices such as human embryo destruction and creation of stem cells, perhaps even early term abortions. Yet geneticists counter that because there is no magic moment after conception when such personhood can be seen to have definitively arrived, conception is the only reasonable inception point. Now clearly religious ethics provide us with more questions than answers. And just as clearly people of faith do not all agree on the moral questions surrounding stem cell research. And we have not even begun to address some of the more troubling questions connected to stem cell research such as the use of stem cells in the creation of chimeras, organisms composed of genetic material from two or more species, the role of abortions or commercial production of fetuses in providing stem cells, or the entire question of cloning. The questions I have raised today, however, are certainly enough to consider for this day, and they include the following. What role might consent play in the considerations of destruction of human embryos for the purpose of creating stem cells? Who can give it and why? What does human personhood mean? At what point does it begin? How is it measured? Whose criteria do we use and for what reasons? 
And I think this is an important one. How can we reconcile public policy restraining the use of public funds for creating stem cells from human embryos on the grounds of moral objections at the same time private production of stem cells continues unabated and relatively unrestricted? Finally, how can we talk about these issues in ways which reject reductionist absolutes such as just a clump of cells or life begins at conception? How can we avoid obfuscating real issues with distracting and distorting polemics while still respecting the passion that many people on both sides of the stem cell research questions experience? Thank you. Thank you.